Welcome back to the best of Commodity Classic. I'm Mark Oppel. Hope you've enjoyed our hour of reviewing a great, great 2023 Commodity Classic. And our last of our associations, the National Association of Wheat Growers, Chandler Gould and I had a talk about some of their policy updates. Well, you know, the Commodity Classic is the annual meeting for the National Association of Wheat Growers. And so where we come back and really review all of our policies, especially our farm bill policies. And, you know, I think we made some uh, very good adjustments uh, between last year and this year. I think one of the key things that we've really honed in on are things like uh, CRP, very important program for conservation. But, you know, that is a program that actually divides wheat growers. It depends if you're in the high desert plains of Washington State or are you in western Kansas or you're in area that's really wet in the in the Carolinas the one size fits all and you're hearing this more and more one size fits all programs do not work for agriculture like they used to and so we have passed policy that we'd like to look at a more regional or regionality type of CRP approach so for the states where it's needed it works best the states where it's maybe causing issue with land uh, land rental rates we can adjust there and still use this important program but make sure it's actually really working for everyone yeah, because it's not you're not a corn you know corn has a season soybeans have a season and wheat, just because of how it's grown, does, cover crops, is, it, is not, it, it just needs a little a special attention. You know, wheat does need a little special attention because you know, wheat is being grown year-round, just like you said. So we're not corn, we're not soy. Uh, winter wheat is somewhere we have run into a little bit of an issue. Uh, we think the cover crop program that the administration has come out with is very important. It helps with moisture. It helps with green, uh, carbon sequestration. But the problem is, if you collect a cover crop payment on your winter wheat, you cannot harvest your wheat. Well, I don't know how you expect our wheat growers to make money because winter wheat is 70% of our production. And so we also passed another resolution saying we need to figure out how we can participate in the cover crop program and still harvest our wheat, qualify for crop insurance, and qualify for Title I. Maybe that means a reduced payment in that cover crop program, but we want to participate but we have to be able to harvest. You avoided the rail strike for the most part as far as wheat growers. Talk about that. I can tell you that the National Association of Wheat Growers was sweating that decision and that, uh, coming down to it. I think a lot of people don't realize no matter if your, our wheat is going for trade markets or if it's going for domestic markets, 75% of U.S. wheat travels by rail at some point during its lifetime and a rail strike would have been devastating to our industry. What about the trend in wheat acreage no matter what class. You know, if you really look at the last 10 to 15 years, unfortunately, uh, we are continuing to see a decline in wheat acres. And I really see the main reason being we are a food grain, not a feed grain. And we are not able to take advantage of the advanced technologies like corn and soy. And the consumer who is still, for some reason, uncertain about this very safe technology of GE, uh, we're slowly pushing the wheat industry out of the United States. You've now got 72-day corn growing in North Dakota and Montana, which used to be big wheat states. And so we need to continue that consumer education so that wheat can take advantage of that technology and we can continue to grow our acreage and not have a decline. I'll give you a 30-second commercial here, Chandler. And someone watching is not a member of the National Association of Wheat Growers. They are a wheat grower two, three generations in. Why should they be a member? You know, because you're on the farm, you're working on your barns, you're getting your land ready, you're plowing, you're, you're harvesting. You don't have time to come to Washington, D.C. all the time. And that's why we are based literally a block from the United States Capitol. We are here as your voice, we are your advocate, and we are here to represent you in Washington, D.C. You know, interesting how each of the different associations have different views and different policy issues. So hopefully that's helpful to you. Kloss has been part of RFD TV. We've done many Rural America Lives. And the last couple, we talked about the supply chain issues. Eric Raby and I talked about that here at Classic. Well, the good news is, is uh, uh, they are getting better uh, in many cases. The bad news is we still are not back to where we were pre-COVID or, or even pre-2022. Uh, but I think one of the things that we've learned, there's always a, a silver lining to many clouds, and that is what can we learn from where, the experiences that we went through. And one of those was really open, robust communication and transparency, not only with our dealers, but also with their customers. We need to understand what are the things that are keeping them up at night in terms of delivery dates and things like that. 
they understand where we're at and we can communicate and work through those together. So that's one thing that we learned that's going to serve us well into the future. You said, Mark, one of the things that still remains is labor. It is. Labor continues to be, and I think for the long term, will be another part of that supply chain that we're always going to have to address. And one of the things we at Kloss really are working toward is the adaptation of useful technology on the farm and in our equipment that reduces that reliance upon labor as much as possible. We still have to have people to intervene and work with the machines, but if we can do more with, uh, uh, with fewer machines and fewer drivers, that's better for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Where are we, where are we on the uh, autonomous side of things here? Well, in terms of uh, autonomy, I always say there's two types of, uh, of technology, really. One is overt that touches the farmer or the operator, and one is covert that's inherent in the machine that you might not see that does provide a level of autonomy. Our new Treon Combine behind me here is an example of that, that it makes the setting changes on the go as crop conditions change, as weather conditions change. So really it turns those drivers into operators uh, very quickly and very easily, which again gives us less of a reliance upon labor but still delivers good productivity in the harvest. Mm -hmm. How does all this change, if any, if you look into 2023 already almost through the first quarter, mm -hmm. the rest of the year? Well, I think the rest of this year, we're going to start to see a, a little bit of a slowdown, if you will. I think the commodities are still trying to fill their way out. I was just in Argentina this week, and the crop is in extremely bad shape. Uh, it's a once-in-a-century drought that they're having down there, so we're going to see fewer corn exports. We're going to see fewer soybean exports, which bodes well for the North America market, provided we do have a normal uh, season, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think uh, overall, rising interest rates and continually rising costs uh, are going to temper some decisions, at least for the short term. Uh, the American uh, agricultural economy is still extremely robust, uh, and it will be another good year, but we're going to start to see a lot more decision making perhaps than we did in the past. Yeah mentioned Farm Point before we came on here today. Let's talk about that. Yeah, what we've done, it's really exciting, is we're taking a new look at the way we go to market, and we feel that after sales is the most important part of ownership of, of, of a machine, and that is the provision of parts and also of service. So what Farm Point has given us the opportunity to do is to try a new model that's really predicated not on bricks and mortar. Uh, we will have bricks and mortar, but it's predicated on remote service and remote delivery of parts to the farm. Uh, and we'll have our first opening uh, in uh, Kentucky and in southern Indiana, so we're extremely excited about yeah. that. What's the reaction from producers when they hear that, especially in those areas? Yeah, it's been really, really positive. Uh, we launched it at the National Farm Machinery Show, which is right in the middle of that, uh, and it was very positive feedback because the farmers say, you're understanding what is important to us. That if, if we provide the after-sales support, then the sales part will happen automatically, but we have to get the parts and service right. Where can our viewers learn more about all the great products at Kloss? Uh, go to kloss.com. Uh, come and see us at the many farm shows that we're at, uh, which are numerous, uh, and we'd love to talk to you. Well, we, like many, agree that we hope that those supply chain issues are resolved sooner than later. Safety on the farm is always important. Randy Marks is with Sukup and talked about some of the technology that they have now to keep the farm safe. So the Sukup Paddle Sweep is one of our newer products out there. It's, it's used to go into those bins, uh, even some existing power sweeps that we have out there, and basically sweep those bins out for you without ever having to enter the bin. And why is it a safer option? So it's a safer option because the paddles actually rub right on the floor, so you don't have to go in there and clean up after it. You let that sweep go around two to three times, and it basically takes all that grain, gets it out of there to the center sump to your reclaim. You don't have to get in, enter the bin. Wow. And this has been in the making, I would imagine. You don't just bring something like this online in a week or two. No, you're right, Mark. We've had this. Uh, we've, we've, we are always looking at safety at Sukup Manufacturing. We say, hey, safety's ingrained at Sukup Manufacturing. So we've been working on this. Uh, we've had our engineering department, our R&D teams really working on this. We've got some different versions out there available too. It's so not just the Ag Series, but we've got a full commercial line as well. Talk about the touch screen control. That's something we wanted to cover here today. Yeah, so the touch screen control, uh, that is a, on our zero entry sweeps option. So we get into those bigger bins. Uh, we've got touch screen that you can go in there. It's all automated, so it turns the pushers off and on. That advances the sweep around. It monitors some of the equipment behind it as well. So if a reclaim conveyor or something would break down, it'll automatically shut off and send a signal up to the control room so they, they know there's an issue there. 
Well, not only safety, but before coming on, you mentioned that it really addresses the labor issue many farmers and ranches are facing. That's true, Mark. Uh, labor, we know, is very hard to come by out there, um, and it's very dangerous to get into the bins. So these paddle sweeps, what they do, uh, they eliminate that need for you to go out and find more help to clean out that bin. This sweep will do it for you. And I, I would also imagine that you, well, some of the technology maybe came from producers themselves who said, hey, can you do this? Can you do that? Yeah, so we've got a lot of different features on our paddle sweep. We've got uh, uh, basically a bridging system there to get clumps of grain that might come down and plug traditional sumps. Yeah. We'll break them up or else get them out of the way so it doesn't do that. So we've had a lot of feedback from our farmer users out there, and we've developed this sweep based on what they've told us to do. By the way, congratulations again on the new facility at Clear Lake, Iowa. Yes, Clear Lake has been a, a come online here doing our mixed flow dryer production. Uh, we've, so we've ramped that up. Obviously, we want to meet all the farmers' needs out there. And where can we learn more about all the great products? So go visit our website, www.sukup.com. Can never talk enough about keeping safe on the farm, especially now we get into the planting season. Everybody wants to get in those fields sooner than later. Corey Rosenbush is CEO of the Fertilizer Institute. He's just returned from appearing before the House Ag Committee. We talked about his testimony. Yeah, we covered a lot of content, um, everything from current market situation to what's going on with uh, the current uh, prices and geopolitical situation. So fertilizers, of course, are produced all around the world. We import about 85% of our product from Canada, our potash from Canada. Mm -hmm. So we are relying on global supply and demand. But we also talked about regulations and, uh, you know, what are some of the restrictions that are preventing these one to four billion dollar capital intensive production plants from expanding. And you said there's a lot of freshmen congressmen on that committee. We had a lot of education to do as we kicked off this new congressional cycle. So everyone wanted to get their questions in, get their comments in. And so this was a great platform to be able to share with them the importance of fertilizer. Half of the world's crop yields on this planet are because of fertilizer use. Yeah. Let's talk about that supply demand update. Give us an update. Well, I think everybody is patiently waiting to see what happens uh, here in the spring. Uh, obviously, what was a particular challenging for farmers is we came off of a period where we had really very low prices for a number of years to the point that we were in a cycle where a lot of fertilizer companies were running deficits, losing money, and some in danger of going out of business. And then we had a record high. And so it's that volatility, I think, that really kind of punches people in the gut sometimes. So we're seeing a bit of a softening in the market going into the spring as farmers take a bit of a wait and see approach. But we have to remember that a lot of that inventory that was built up for the spring was done in the fall and winter when those prices were still a bit of inflated. Yeah. Now, also want to talk before we run out of time here, the bio stimulant certification. I wrote that down because it's very important to you, I know, and the Institute. So one of the things that we saw during you know, the market conditions that we had was one, farmers wanted to be efficient with their nutrient use. And so the four R's of nutrient stewardship and making sure you're using all of that product to the right source rate, time and place was incredibly critical when you're looking at fertilizer prices. But they also were willing to explore other technologies, high crop, uh, high commodity prices they were, get, they were receiving for their own yields. So what are the things that we can do to maximize that yield? Biostimulants is one of those technologies. And when I talk to ag retailers, one of their challenges is that they have thousands of products that are coming across their desk right now. How do they evaluate them? How do they see what works for the farmer? And so what we've done is built a standard around biostimulants that help define safety, composition, and efficacy. And then at the end of the day, we'll give that product a certification that will hopefully narrow that funnel a bit. Retailers are still going to have to do field trials and, and experiment with some of these soils and crops uh, with their farmers, but give them a leg up for making those recommendations for the new technologies that are coming at the farmer fast and furious. Yeah. What about the work we can learn more about what going on with the Institute? Yeah, go to TFI.org. We have great resources there as well for nutrient stewardship for farmers.
You bet. And just uh, real quick, uh, some, someone may say, I don't really know what the Institute does. Obviously, appearing before a committee is huge, but other things that, are, you're, that you're doing every day. Yeah, so we are the trade association for the fertilizer industry. We represent manufacturers, wholesale distributors, importers, all the way to ag retail. Uh, I think for a lot of uh, folks involved in agriculture, we spend a lot of time developing programs around uh, nutrient stewardship and how farmers can use the four R's in their field. Obviously, advocacy for the industry is our our number one objective. I know you're getting ready for the new season. It's right around the corner. I think everyone's guilt built uh, gearing up. They've got their uh, sheds full and ready to go. Well, that wraps up our coverage of the 2023 Commodity Classic. Plans are already underway for next year, and they hope to see you in Houston starting February 29th. Yes, it's a leap year next year, and we'll be there as well. I'm Mark Oppold. Good night from Rural America's most important network.